Shalom, Rabbi Gary here, and thank you for checking out this week's teaching. I really hope you're touched by the message, and I want to personally invite you to join us next Saturday to worship with us. You can plan your visit by clicking on the link in the description below or by going to MessianicLA.com. I'm looking forward to meeting you soon, so enjoy the message. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And thank you guys. You guys sounded great this morning. We missed Miriam. That would have been nice with a little violin in there too, right? And trombone. We needed the trombone. <laughs> but that was great. Thank you guys for leading us in worship this morning. So what we're doing is next week is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Feast of Pentecost, 50-day feast after the resurrection of Messiah. And so it is the time that the Jewish people celebrate the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And while the law was given at Mount Sinai, according to the Brit HaDashah in Acts chapter 2, on that very same occasion, the Lord gave the gift of his spirit, even as he promised that he would. If I don't go away, then the parakletos, the one called alongside, cannot come. But if I go, then I can send him and he will come and he will be with you uh, forever. So we were looking at, we're just ta focusing our attention on the work of the Holy Spirit. So last week, we were focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit in saving individuals, in salvation. And we saw that there are five ministries that the Spirit of God had exercised in the leading of individuals to faith. Every one of those experiences you and I have had. Those experiences are not necessarily ones that we will feel there are truths that the Holy Spirit does irrespective of how we feel about it or what we experience as a result of it. But we've all experienced it. So the first thing that we're told, uh, Messiah said in John 16 that he would send the, Messiah, uh, the Spirit who would do three things. He'd convict, convict the world of um, sin, justice, and ju uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we saw that what the Greek word to convict means it means is to make clear. And so what would he would do is he would make clear to us our sinfulness so that we would know that we had a need for the righteous one. When he convicts the world of righteousness, he's convicting the world or convincing the world or those in the world that he convinces of the righteousness of Messiah. So what he's doing is he's making clear to us that we have a need for the righteous one. And he makes clear to us that regarding judgment, that is that there are consequences if we fail to take uh, advantage of the righteous one who can deal with our sin. That's the first thing he does. Every one of us that has come to faith has come through that channel. We all came to the realization we had a need. We may not have called it sin, we may have used a different word, but we knew that we were alienated from God. And we knew we had a need. That need was sin, whether or not we understood it completely or not, it was made clear to us. And what was also made clear to us is that Yeshua the Messiah is the righteous one of Israel. And because he's the righteous one, we turned our attention to him. And we were convinced at some point that if we don't turn our attention to him, there are consequences for a failure to embrace him. So the first thing the Spirit of God did was he made clear to us sin, righteousness, and judgment. The second thing he did was he brought life to us. Scripture speaks of it as regeneration. In the book of Titus, we were reborn by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. What that means is, is he brought life into us. Scripture says we're dead in trespasses and sins. But he, because he is the way, the truth, and the life, by means of his spirit, breathed life into us. It's much like what happens in the book of Genesis. He creates man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathes upon him, and he becomes a living being. Similarly, we too are dead in trespasses and sins. The Lord breathed upon us, and we became a living being. We were regenerate. We were made alive unto God. We thought we were alive. We always thought we were alive. But we realize that in Genesis it says, in the day that you eat, dying you will surely die. And thus we were dying. And we were alienated from God. But no longer. Now the Spirit of God has breathed life into our mortal bodies. So number one, he made clear to us our need. Number two, he gave us life. He regenerated us. Thirdly, he then indwelt us. 
Messiah said, the Spirit of God is with you and will be in you. So there's really a very interesting furtherance of the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Not only is he in our midst, but he's within us. And so Paul says, we are the temple of the Spirit of God. Don't you know that you are the temple of the Spirit of God and that the Lord dwells within you? And so on the one hand, he dwells within us as a congregation, but he also dwells within us individually as his children. So the Spirit of God in the work of salvation has made clear to us our need, his righteousness, and consequences for failure. He's brought us to life, he's regenerated us, and he has further indwelt us. The living God of the universe, the one who is all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere, has chosen to localize himself and to dwell within us. That's just mind-boggling to think. So he not only has made clear to us, not only regenerated us, not only has he indwelt us, but he has also immersed us in the body of Messiah. He has placed us in the body of Messiah. We read this in Corinthians as well, as, as well as in Romans chapter 6, that we were all baptized, immersed into one body, whether Jew or Gentile. That's the work of the Spirit of God who places us in the body of Messiah, and that body is made up of all kinds of people from all kinds of generations, from all kinds of ages, from all kinds of geographical areas, all kinds of cultures, all kinds of languages. And so it's exciting to me to be here at Beth Ariel in Los Angeles where, you know, people come and they, say, and they walk in and then when they leave they say it was really great in coming. What was really striking is how different we all look. You know, we have like dark people, we have lighter than dark people, then we have light people. We have all kinds of people of color, of shape, sizes, ages, and of ethnicities. We have pretty people. We have pretty, pretty people. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate that. Yeah. But the point is, we truly are a wonderful representation, maybe not a perfect one, but a wonderful one of the body of Messiah. There are some churches we go into, right? They're all white. They're all black. They're all Asian. Nothing wrong with that either. But it's wonderful when you come into a body where there's a respect for a given culture that our Messiah came from, the Jewish culture, but yet we are a variety of peoples who all come together because we love Messiah, the Messiah of the Jewish people, and he's our Messiah and Lord. Amen. But we've been immersed in one body, both Jew and Gentile. That's something the Spirit of God did to us and for us. And lastly, he sealed us 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4. He sealed us unto the day of redemption. All of those things he did and you never felt one of them. You didn't feel him sealing you. He sealed you the moment you believed. You probably didn't even know it happened. You didn't even know there was such a thing as a sealing. I don't mean a sealing. I mean a sealing <laughs> which is like an authorization, a certification that we are certified for eternal life. It says that the Spirit of God is a seal or a guarantee or a down payment. So he's the indicator of the certainty of our eternal life. We don't have to go around like daisies, you know, where we pluck the daisy and we say, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. No, he just always loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. And that's because of the sealing work of the Spirit of God. All those things happen to all of us and they have eternal consequences. Yet none of us really felt any of them. Our minds were open and we saw properly, things were cleared. God came into our lives by faith, by grace through faith, and we were made alive. We didn't even know. At the moment we may have felt joy, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Maybe you sort of just morphed into it, and you sort of rode this wave, but it, seemed, it didn't seem like a dramatic falling off the edge of a cliff kind of a thing, or jumping high up in the air. For some it's like the jump, for others it's just a smooth ride in. But all of us have been made alive unto God. All of us have been indwelt by the Spirit of God. You probably didn't even know that when it first happened. Probably didn't even feel anything. But all of a sudden, the Spirit of God took up residence in our very being. And then he placed us in this great body of believers. He did all of that. And we weren't even necessarily conscious of it, except we responded to his grace. But the Spirit of God doesn't stop there. 
He then works with us in our life in him since coming to know Yeshua as our Messiah. So what else does he do for us? So turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're going to go through a series of passages. We'll see how many we get. I'm hoping maybe six, but we want to. Uh, there's a wedding here this afternoon. They're coming at two uh, to set up. So they're kicking us out, throwing us out the door. But uh, no, we're usually done by 1230 anyway, so we should be good. But I'm, I'm trying to, you know, see if we can move this up a little bit for everybody's sake. But no guarantees. No guarantees. <laughs> So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first thing I want to focus on is the Spirit of God, after doing those things for us already in salvation, He now does some things for us in our life of faith. The first thing He does is He grants us gifts. Spiritual gifts, we call them. And we've looked at this a few weeks before, so I don't need to get into great detail, but I do want to focus on a couple of things. Just in verse 4, there are a variety of gifts. So no one, no one congregation has necessarily all the gifts. And no, uh, no gift is given to necessarily every person in a given body. He says there are a variety of them. And if you look going down to verse 11, they are all given by the same Spirit who apportions to each. See that? He apportions to each. In other words, some people may have a larger degree of a given gift than some others. They are apportioned. So we may have the gift of, let me just speak about this, say the gift of teaching, for example. But there may be some who are off the chart teachers. There may be others who are okay teachers, but they're all apportioned by God's grace and God's spirit. And every congregation has what they need for the Lord is providing for his congregation. And he says here in 1 Corinthians 12, if you look at verse 7, it's for the common good. So the gifts that are present are the gifts God has decreed to be in that given congregation because that is what they need for the work that they are to be called to do. And thereby building up one another and reaching out to the community. Certain gifts are for that purpose. But here's another interesting thing. We're not going, I don't want to get into what the gifts mean, but I think about this as one who has received a gift. And when I think about the gift of teaching, you know, there's no gift of teaching youth. There's no gift of teaching adults. There's no gift of teaching children. You either have a gift of teaching or you don't have a gift of teaching. And if you have a gift of teaching, it, it is applicable to any age group, any person, any context. That doesn't mean we, we don't learn about the uniqueness of the people to whom we are entrusted to say teach. But it does mean that the gift of teaching is simply that. And it's not so specified. But personalities come into play. Opportunities, experience, training, all those things are part of the working of the Spirit of God in the, distribu in the distributing of the gifts he gives. The gifts are given, but that doesn't mean they're not developed. Gifts are given, but it doesn't mean that they're not learned how to be used. And so the Spirit of God, first of all, grants us gifts. And it would appear, I say would appear, that every individual is given at least one gift. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who are portions to each one. So it would appear that everyone has a spiritual gift, which means we have a responsibility to discover so as to use our gift because everyone must contribute to the common good, the edification, the building up, and the blessing of one another. In other words, the way that we bless one another is by the exercising of our gifts. If we don't know our gifts, we can't bless one another. Or if we are blessing one another and you don't understand or don't know what gift God has, has entrusted to you, then you're not fully able to utilize that gift for the common good because you're not aware of what it is. So it's important that we somehow learn to discover it. And there aren't any tricks to the trade, you know, in how to discover these things. I would say there's just some very basic things we need to be thinking about. Number one, you have to be willing to serve because that's what the gifts are for. They're not for the personal benefit or edification, although they do that. They're for the common good. So you have to be one who wants to be a benef of benefit to the common good, which is another way of saying you have to be willing to serve. And to be willing to serve means you have to be willing to sacrifice. What do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice your time. Because if you're going to help somebody else, it means you can't help yourself. 
right? You got to be thinking about others. So that means you got to sacrifice. You got to sacrifice most significantly, I think, your time. You got to sacrifice your space. You can't be where you want to be. Like tonight, I'd like to be in Missouri to see the, the Bruins. That's where I'd like to be. Or in Fenway, you know, to, or New York to see the Yankees taking on my beloved Red Sox, although they lost last night. But no, 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 no. I have to say, look, that's what I'd like to do. Not that I can afford to do it, but if I could, that's what I might like to do. But I'm not going to choose to do what I like to do because I want to be a benefit to where God would want me to be a benefit to others. So the first thing is we have to be willing to serve. The second thing is we have to be willing to sacrifice. We have to be willing to give up. And thirdly, we have to be willing to do what God wants us to do and not what we might prefer to do. And so those are tricky things. They require some prayer, but they require time and energy and involvement and investment. And it's in that context that the gifts begin to surface. People are benefited by what we do. And then we're sort of acknowledged with what God has enabled us to do. There's also another interesting passage. If you turn to 1 Peter, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians, although we're going to move from there. But in 1 Peter, in chapter 4, He says, beginning in chapter 4, verse 8, he says, above all, most important of all things, he says, keep loving one another, and I love this, keep loving one another earnestly. You know, you've got to work hard at loving one another. Since love covers a multitude of sins, that's why it's hard, because there's sin, and we still wrestle with it. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. And so there it is again. Everyone has received a gift. But what are we to use it for? To serve one another. And it's really interesting here too. Because he says, he shows us how that is done. He says, for example, as God's stewards of God's varied grace. You know, the word for spiritual gift is the word charismata. That's where we get the word charismatic from. Charis. Charis in charismatic is the Greek word for grace. Charis and mata is the word for thing. So a charismata is a grace thing. So a spiritual gift is a grace thing. It's something that is given by God's grace. That's what the word means. And so now P Peter is saying that we're to love one another, show hospitality. Each has received a charis charismata as God's stewards of God's varied charis. Is that kind of neat? His, the various grace things are a manifestation of his varied graces as he's graced us all differently with the different gifts. So that also means something else. We need each other. Not only is it important for us if we're going to exercise our gifts, which God is giving us by his spirit, Remember, we're focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of believers. One of the things he's done among those five things that led you to faith, he's also given you a gift. And why is he given that gift? So that we benefit one another. Why? Because we need each other. So if I'm not engaged in sharing my gift, you guys lose out. And I don't experience the edification that I might otherwise experience by exercising my gift and vice versa. If you don't exercise you get your gift, then we are all losing out. And further, you're not experiencing the joy of having that sense of being used by God. And there's nothing greater than having that sense that you really make a difference and mean something special and unique because it's something God wants you to do. So we don't have to go crazy about this, but we need to take seriously. Now we understand why Paul at the front, front end of 1 Corinthians 12 says, Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I want you to be fully aware of the importance of spiritual gifts because they're important for your congregation. They're important for you personally. And they're important because it's God at work in and through you. And so if we step back and say, wow, we've come to faith. Look what the Spirit of God has led us to come to. Well, that continues now as believers. And so we want to 
be mindful about utilizing our gifts to the glory of God. So the second thing that I wanted to show you is if you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Not only is the Spirit of God at work within us currently as he shares with us the spiritual gifts he might entrust to us, but second thing that he does, he fills us. It's one thing to speak about him indwelling us, he's present with us, but then it says he fills us. So look at Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 5. And he says in verse 18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, it's a contrast to being drunk with wine. But there's also a similarity. When you're drunk with wine, you're controlled by a foreign substance. And you behave strangely. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're controlled now by the Spirit of God. And you behave in unique ways. You accomplish things that you would not otherwise be able to accomplish because of the presence of God in a filling kind of manner. Now here's some other interesting things. Some people, talk, some we're going to see this next week, confuse the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit with the filling work of the Holy Spirit. They're two separate independent activities of the Lord. When you read about the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit, it's always in the passive. It's something that happens to you. It's never an imperative. You're never commanded, be baptized. But with the filling, this is an imperative. Here, this is saying, this is commanding us to be filled. And what's also interesting, with respect to the word baptized in the Spirit, while baptized is not an imperative, it's also in what's called in the Greek an aorist tense. I mentioned this once before. It means there's a point in time it occurs and the results of it go on forever. There's no end to it. So when you read about being baptized, it's a verb, but it's an aorist verb, which means it happened at a point of time and the effects of it go on for all of time. That's not the tense you ever find with filling. With filling, it's always in the present tense. Never in the heiress. What that means is, it means something that is to be done continually. Heiress means it happens at a point in time, didn't happen then, 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 now it happened. And the effects of it go on forever. In the present tense, it means it's something that is to be continually pursued. Baptism, you don't continually pursue it. It happens at one point in time and it has its eternal effects. But be filled is a command not baptism. Be filled and be filled ongoingly. That means that's something we need to pursue all the time. And it's something available to us all the time. And what is the ramifications of being filled with the Spirit? What is the purpose of it? It's always with respect to service. It's interesting, we won't look at it today, but in the book of Acts, it's always attached to the speaking of God's truth. So in Acts chapter 2, it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, gets up and he proclaims the message, 3,000 people are saved. In Acts chapter 4, it says, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit again. He speaks up and he speaks the word of God to the Sanhedrin that is in the process of persecuting him. And they are all mystified. How is this one able to speak like this, being that he's not a learned person? He never was one in, in one of our rabbinic academies. He's a fisherman. And then it says, and they perceived he was with Messiah. So while he may not have been in an academy, he had some good training. But in addition to the training, he had the filling of the Spirit that took the training and brought it to fruition. It's not as if Peter spent a whole lot of time, you know, meditating and focusing on this. And he said, now I'm ready to go. This is just 40, 50 days after the resurrection. And this is at a time after he's prayed and the Spirit of God now fills him and he does something extraordinary because the Spirit of God is in control of him and he's able to do something unique that he wouldn't have otherwise been able to do, which was to proclaim the truth of God's message in a way that he might not otherwise be able to proclaim it. And so in Ephesians, what's interesting, look at Ephesians 5.18. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? So you could address one another. There it is again. 
The filling of the Spirit is connected with verbalization. In the book of Acts, it always is. Here in Ephesians chapter 5, it's the same thing. So when you address one another, when you converse with one another, when you speak to one another, when you interact with one another, you do so in a positive way. You do so in a loving, kind way. You do so in a sensitive way. Look what he says. You address one another in psalms and hymns. He means to say as you address one another, you're doing so with the with the psalms and hymns and the joy of the Lord in the heart of your soul. And you can only do that when you're filled with the Spirit because otherwise you would be more prone to address things with complaining and grumbling and murmuring and disputing. It's not to say there isn't a place for disputing or debating. I'm not saying that. But when you address one another, He's talking about fellow believers that love the Lord, that are in one body. We're in this thing together. And when you address one another, when you're filled with the Spirit, you will do so by expressing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. You would be a thankful person, thanking always for everything, submitting to one another out of reverence. This, is all the, this doesn't come naturally. This comes because the Spirit of God is now at work in filling us. What does it mean to fill, to control? That's what the Greek word means. So it means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And what is the Spirit of God's main purpose is? Messiah tells us when He comes, He will tell you of me. So the Holy Spirit's whole work is to draw our attention to the Messiah. Theologians refer to this as the self-effacing of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't draw attention to himself. He draws attention to Messiah. That's why there's so little spoken about the Spirit of God. That's why he's so nebulous and so difficult to sort of grasp hold of. We all the time struggle with even seeing him as a person because he's drawing our attention to one who, can, who is always seen as a person, the Messiah. And that's his role, and he rejoices in it. And so he's meant to draw our attention to Messiah. And so when he controls us, what do we do? We draw one another's attention to Messiah. How do we do that? Through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and with reverence for one another and submitting loving and kindness to one another. So in, as believers, the Spirit of God is at work. How is he at work? Number one, he provides us with gifts. Number two, he controls us. He fills us as we respond to the imperative. Be controlled. It doesn't happen just naturally. It happens when we dedicate ourselves. Remember what Paul says in Romans 12 verse 1? He says, therefore offer yourselves as living sacrifices, which is your spiritual work or spiritual responsibility. Offer yourselves. We have to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. We have to offer ourselves to him and say, Lord, I desire and delight in being controlled by you. That requires a lot of trust. That requires a relinquishing of a lot of self. That requires that we look to him so as to do what he would have us to do for him. So the third thing I want you to look at is if you look at John. So we looked at 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5. Now look at John chapter, I want to say chapter 16. And in chapter 16, we have a third work of the Spirit. We said that um, he get, brings gifts, he controls us. Third thing, if you look at chapter 16, he says in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Isn't that a telling expression? I got a lot more to tell you. When John writes his gospel, right, this is John, when he comes to the end, he says, these things are written so that you might believe that Yeshua is the Son of God, right? He says, but if I was to write all the things he did, not even all the books of the, of the world could contain them. And now Messiah is telling us, I've got many more things to tell you. And John just told, tells us at the end, if he was to tell you all the things, there wouldn't be enough books. And now Messiah is saying, I've got even more stuff to tell you. But you can't endure them now. You can't bear them now. You won't be able to understand them now. He's been telling them that I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to ri rise on the third day. And they're saying, far be it from you, Lord. They can't bear it yet. So how are they going to know the things Messiah is yet to tell them? He's going to die in a few hours from John 16. And yet he's got many more things to teach them. 
How is he going to teach them in light of the fact that he's going to be crucified, then he's going to be raised, he's going to send to the Father? They won't see him again. He's telling them that. You won't see me anymore. But I go to prepare a place for you. And when it's time for you to see me, I will come again and bring you unto myself. That way you are, you may be also, he says in John 14. So now he's saying, i got many things to teach you. You can't bear it. How is he going to teach them? Well, he tells us. Look at verse 12. I have many things to teach you. You can't bear them. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Now, there's a little phrase there, a little word that's very critical to understanding this passage. It's the word, the. Notice he said he would not lead you into all truth. He doesn't say that. He says, I will lead you into all of the truth. What is the truth? The truth are the things he wants to teach them. So what is he telling us? Not only will the Spirit of God, as ones who are believers and love him, are ones who will be gifted by him, are ones who can be filled by him, controlled by him if we yield ourselves to him, but the Spirit of God is the one who will also teach us the things Messiah intended to teach his disciples. Isn't that amazing? You know, the very things Yeshua intended to teach his disciples, which he didn't, they didn't, couldn't bear at that time, he said, I'm going to send the Messiah and uh, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to teach you those things. And so there are two things here at play. Number one, it's the disciples themselves. The Spirit of God is going to teach them, those 11, and then Mattathias, those 11, that one, 12, the things the Messiah wanted them to learn. And now the Spirit of God teaches us the things Messiah wanted them to learn that has been inscribed in the Brit Hadashah. So how do we understand the Brit Hadashah? We understand it by the work of the Spirit of God enabling us to understand the things Messiah intended to teach them. So the passage doesn't mean the Holy Spirit will lead us in all truth. That's not what it means. He will lead us and teach us all the truth that Messiah wanted to be taught, them to be taught. And all of that truth that Messiah wanted to be taught is here. And that's why we need to be students of the Word, because the Word is the Word of Messiah. Amen. And the Word of Messiah, He intended us to learn. Yes. And He intends us to learn it by means of His Spirit, because He can't be with us here teaching us. So now his spirit dwells within us. He's given us gifted individuals. And now his word gets disseminated to us. And so now there's sort of a dual thing. You have people with gifts of teaching and knowledge and, and uh, word of knowledge and so on. They have these gifts. And they're conveying the teaching of Messiah through the understanding and the interpretation of his word. And as we listen to them make it known to us. We have the Spirit of God within us that confirms to us what's being taught. We never just sit idly and listen. We listen actively, depending on the Spirit of God to help us understand what's being said and to bring to our conviction a sense of truthfulness. That doesn't mean we don't have differences, and that doesn't mean that because there are differences, someone's right and someone's wrong. That's true. I mean, you can't be... There are differences of opinion with the return of the Lord, right? There's some believe there'll be a messianic age for a thousand years. That's where we hang out. There's some that deny that. One of us is wrong. And so that's because of differing perspectives. But nevertheless, when we come to the Word, the Spirit of God is the one we look to through the giftedness, through His personal relationship to us, to discern, to understand, and to put into practice his word. The Spirit of God will give us gifts. The Spirit of God will control us. The Spirit of God will teach us. Last three things, they're all found in Romans chapter 8. And I'll say these quickly. In Romans chapter 8, Paul also draws our attention to the work of the Spirit. Not only will he provide gifts, not only will he fill, not only will he teach, but he will also lead. Look at Romans chapter 8. He says in verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons or as children, 
by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So fourthly, the Spirit of God will lead us. He will guide us. He will direct us. And it's very interesting. He says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Not just some of us. You know, that's how cults get started. People say, see, the Lord is leading me, so follow me. No, no, no. It says all are led by the Spirit. All have an individual responsibility to God and to his word to be responsive to it. And so we don't look to any one man or woman or individual. It's the spirit who must lead. And all who are children of God have the spirit of God so as to lead them. We just need to follow. So the spirit of God gives gifts. This is in the life of a believer now, life of those that have come to know Yeshua as Messiah. He provides us with spiritual gifts. Grace things that come from the Spirit of God. He controls us. He fills us as we respond to the imperative continually through dedication of self. He will teach us and guide us as we immerse ourselves in God's Word, sit under healthy teachers that can help us understand how the Word of God is to be interpreted and understood. We learn from that. I was very privileged to sit under some wonderful men and women of God in both college, university, and graduate school in order to learn the skills that are involved. And with the partnering and the work of the Spirit of God, working together with, through gifted individuals, it was an amazing experience that I'm very grateful for. And not only will he teach us, now we're told he will lead us. Not only will he lead us, but get this, he gives us assurance. Look at verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. He gives us assurance. You ever doubt whether or not the Lord really loves you? We've all gone through those stages and maybe sometimes ongoingly at different state points in time. The Spirit of God witnesses to our very heart. We have two advocates. We have the Messiah who is in heaven as our great high priest, who is an advocate. First John tells us he's our advocate. And now Yeshua is telling, or Paul is telling us, we have another advocate. That advocate is the Spirit of God, who's not in the presence of God per se, but is in our hearts. And he bears witness to our spirit. Why? Because we doubt. And we also oftentimes question, what is God up to? Doesn't he love me? Doesn't he care for me? Why is he allowing me to go through this? Spirit of God then takes control and says, hey, hold on, be cool. I'm here with you. The Lord loves you. These are challenging moments, but I'm here to get you through them. We live in a sinful world, a fallen world. We all suffer. We all struggle with things. We all have challenges and trials of all kinds. But you're mine, and I'm going to bring you through. Remember, there's an eternal life that we, you have inherited. Not just a moment of 70 plus, take a few, give a few years. We've got an eternal life ahead of us. And we're already in it for all of eternity. I know it never seems that way or, or, doesn't, or there are moments when it doesn't seem that way. It seems like this is all there is. But the Spirit bears witness to our spirit that really is something beyond this life. And not only that, you're headed to meet Him. And that's the assurance that He provides. And one last thing, the sixth thing that the Spirit of God does as believers. He's praying for you. Not only does he give us gifts, not only does he fill us, control us, not only does he teach us the things Messiah wants us to learn, not only does he lead us, not only does he give us assurance, but look at chapter 8 again, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not what, know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings. We cannot utter or too deep for words. By the way, the interesting thing here, you see it says the Holy Spirit is groaning. What that means is he's empathizing with your groans. Holy Spirit doesn't groan. He knows what God's intentions and purposes are. He's talking about he empathizes with you in your groaning prayers and groans them for you before the Lord. That's what he's saying. Well, you could see that because if you go back to uh, verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been doing what? Groaning. 
Look at verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit. What do we do? We groan inwardly. We're the ones groaning. And the Holy Spirit empathizes with our sufferings. That's what he means by groanings. And then he prays for us with respect to those sufferings. I mean, if we just had that one, that would be the one, right? Where the Spirit of God is praying the will of God to God in our behalf in the midst of our anguish, our struggles, our sufferings, our question marks. I mean, he's there on our side. And we don't know what to say because I don't know what to say. You know, I visit people in the hospital. I've been visiting with Celia. We want to pray for her. I've been visiting with Sandy Miller. We want to pray for her. I visit with people and they ask me, what's going on? I don't know. I mean, all I know is we live in a fallen world. And right now you're experiencing what that means in its ultimate meaning. I don't have the answers for that. I can only direct your attention to the one who does. And he may or may not answer your questions now or today or in this life. But he'll pray for you and he'll come alongside of you and he will empathize with you and he will feel your pain with you. Isn't that incredible? I mean, Messiah does that, right? He, took our, he carried our sorrows. He carried them. He took your sorrows and he didn't just throw them over there. He placed them on his shoulders. Nasa. He lifted them up, Isaiah says. And he carried them on his shoulders. He took them from you and embraced them unto himself that he might give us life. And now the Holy Spirit, in light of what the Messiah has carried, is praying in our behalf that we will somehow make it through and we will rejoice in him when we get to the other side. So the Spirit of God, he has been central in our salvation. And he is central in our life in him. If we remember, the things that he's doing in our behalf presently. He has gifted you. And therefore, we need to discover those gifts by becoming sacrificial, giving of our time, our service, and seeking to provide for the common good. He's given us, each one of us at least one gift, some of us perhaps more. But he's gifted us. He will control you. Isn't that amazing to think of? He will fill you. It means he will control you. It's an imperative. It's something you have to obey to have happen. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit and ongoingly. Every day we got to get up the Lord and say, Lord, I dedicate myself to you and control me this day. May I do your will and may you enable me to do it. We need to learn from him because he's our teacher and he's going to teach us the things of Messiah. They're found here. That's why the Bible must be our preeminent source, not our experiences. Not what people say they've experienced. That's not what we're about. You know, you have your experience. That's your experience. Hold on to it. But this is the teaching of Messiah that we need to ultimately come to grips with. Not only that, he'll lead you. Not only will he lead you, he'll give you assurance. Not only that, he's praying for us. And he's praying for us knowing full well of the groans that are part of our life and our reality. So we want to dedicate ourselves to him so that we'd walk faithfully before him. So let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for these marvelous truths. We pray that you might help us to experience them in all of their fullness. The work of salvation, those were things that happened unconsciously, but they happened. But these are things now we can experience consciously. We can exercise gifts that you've given. We can, ex we can experience being controlled by you to do your will when we give, uh, offer ourselves for service. We can learn from you as you teach us and we can learn new things. And as we listen to others that you have already taught that can help clarify for us what is contained in your word. Father, we need you to lead us and to lead us preeminently in the paths of righteousness for your namesake. 
And Father, there are always times when we question, always moments of doubt and anxiety about our relationship with you. But you are our full assurance as you bear witness to our spirit that we truly are yours and we belong to you. And nothing can happen to us that is outside the parameters of your will for us. And your will for us is always for our benefit ultimately. And then, Lord, you, your spirit is in prayer mode always, empathizing with our groanings and praying in our behalf in spite of our weakness in, in order that we might experience your empowerment and your strength. We bless you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. Help us to dedicate ourselves afresh each and every day and help us to walk in your ways, that we would walk moment by moment, step by step. We wouldn't run too far, we wouldn't lag behind, but we would walk with you, alongside of you, as you guide and direct us each and every way. We pray in Messiah's name, amen. We're going to continue to worship the Lord as we draw our service to a close. If you came to worship the Lord in giving, our ushers are here to help you. Those of you online, if you'd like to give through a mobile device, you can do so by texting your gift to 925-718-0020, 925-718-0020. If you'd like to write us, you have any questions, or if you'd like to send a gift, you'd like to show your partnership with us, you can write by writing us at Beth Ariel, P.O. Box 5340, West Hills, California, 91308. We'd look forward to hearing from you. Why don't we stand together and we'll close our service. Shalom, everyone, and thank you so much for checking out this week's teaching. If you like this video, click the subscribe button to join our online community. If we've impacted you and you want to partner with us, you can click the Give Here button on my left. We would love to have you join us in person next Saturday, so plan your visit now by going to MessianicLA.com or by clicking the link below.